Tonight I'm continuing our teaching on partners in the gospel. Partners in the gospel. Partners. There's a sound. I don't know. Maybe check the treble or for the back of mic. Something is sound. Partners in the gospel. Or, or switch off something. Partners in the gospel. Partners in the gospel. And in part one, we were able to consider very important matters. All right. We were able to identify a very essential point last week that every Christian, every child of God is actually conscripted to be a partner in the gospel. That every child of God has the mandate of the Great Commission. That there is no Christian on the face of the earth that has been exonerated from the pursuit all right, towards the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And we also learned last week that everybody on the face of the earth also has a gift. There is always something that you can contribute towards the advancement of the kingdom of God on the face of the earth. All right. And another thing we said last week very quickly, especially for those that are coming for the first time, is that, listen, no role is insignificant. And if you remember the analogy of the human body, that there is no part of the human body that is insignificant. The liver may not be seen, but it is relevant. And every part of the human body must work effectively to have a healthy system and to have a healthy function on the face of the earth. Tonight, by the grace of God, I want us to make progress in our teaching. Turn with me very quickly to the book of Romans chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Romans chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. We are in partnership in the gospel, part 2. Romans chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, it will be great. Chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. If you are there, I'd like us to read together as our custom is Romans chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Let's go now. 1, 2, ready, read. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. King James may likely say, to the end that you may be established. My version says, to make you strong. Notice, teaching, and I want to start with that tonight, that teaching is for grooming. Teaching is for grooming. The teaching of the word of God is for grooming us. It's for preparing us. It's for making us ready to be effective partners in the gospel. Teaching is for grooming. Impartation. If teaching is for grooming, impartation is for effective delivery of your assignment. Teaching is to grooming, to prepare you. Impartation is, all right, supernatural endowment so that you can be effective in your assignment. Meaning that, I know some of you might have seen videos on TikTok and some of the videos that trend are manifestation videos where people are eating grass, people are drinking Coke and Fanta, people are drinking gallons of oil, people are rolling on the floor, people are saying they are vomiting all kinds of things. And people like to watch all those things. But according to scripture, what impartation does is not to allow for drama. Impartation is for effectiveness in God's assignment for your life. Meaning that when Paul was talking to the church in Rome, and then he says, I desire to see you, that I may impart to you spiritual gifts to the end that you are made strong that you are established. What Paul is saying is that whether you fall down or not is not the goal. What matters is that when hands are laid on you and you receive an impartation, the impartation is to fulfill a specific assignment. If the average Christian understands this, your goal will not be for many people to lay hands on you. Your goal will be to be a faithful Christian doing what you can do where you are and then as time goes on, God knows how to add to the measure that he has given you. Are we together? So look at your neighbor and say, teaching is for grooming. Come on, come on. Easy, easy. Say, teaching is for grooming. 
Impartation is for effectiveness, not drama. Second thing I want us to look at tonight, as I begin to enter really into the teaching, is that please hear, hear what I'm about, I'm about to say. To be left alone, to carry leadership burden, is very tough and frustrating. We are not the first set of believers that is going to start a walk. We are not the first church that is going to be a young church. And we are not the first set of people that will not be in their thousands when they gather on Sunday. But you must understand this. There is no successful Moses without Aaron's, without Paul's, without elders, 70 elders, without Jethro's. Every leader needs people who are committed to the corporate vision, who will play their own well, so that the will of God is able to be actualized. Now, Second Timothy chapter 1. Paul is writing to his protege Timothy in Second Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 15. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. If you're there, I want us to read it together. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. 1, 2, ready, go. You know, thank you, that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Philegos and Hermogenes. Now, notice something interesting here. Who is writing here? Who is talking here? Uh, are we Bible students here? Of course, if there's anywhere they should Bible students here, are we Bible students here? Who is talking here? Paul, what did he say? He says, you know that some people have what? Deserted me. They have left me. They have abandoned me. They have walked away from me. Now, if Paul and Apostle, I mean, if you want to mention, some people even think that Paul was one of the 12 disciples. I hope you know there are people that think Paul was, I think Paul was one of the 12 disciples. They say, oh, no, 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 he came later. Listen, Paul did mighty works for Jesus Christ. Is that true? But if you study all of Paul's letters and all of Paul's ministry, there was no time Paul did ministry alone. There would be always somebody that was there making themselves available to make sure sometimes Paul did not write his letters. Sometimes they wrote it for him. Are you following? Why? Because no man on earth, no matter how zealous he is, can fulfill the purpose of God alone. You will always meet somebody else. One of the wisdom of God in giving us a local assembly is that we can pull strength to accomplish a corporate vision. Are we together? That is why, see, once you understand this, you will realize that as a church member, as a church worker, you are important to the assignment of God the same way your pastor is also important. There are places today where people will not be to be deacons and bright to be church leaders simply because they do not understand that it is only a privilege to serve and we don't need to manipulate our way into it. There are places today where we have what we call unhealthy competition and there is strife and there is vain glory. Why? Everybody wants to be at the forefront but unfortunately, what we must understand is that if everybody is at the forefront, who will be behind the scenes? And so, what I want us to understand tonight is that the will of God for everyone in Christ is to be a partner. The pastor does not own the vision. The pastor only receives the vision as it is laid down in the word of God. The members do not own the vision in the sense that it is not just their own vision. It is our vision. Look at your neighbor and say, it is our vision. Uh -uh. Say it is our vision. Second Timothy, system. Second Timothy. Look at chapter four, verse nine. Chapter four, verse nine. I can imagine how Paul would have felt. He said they deserted me. They walked away, and you know he knows the names of those that left him, and he knows the names of those that stood with him. Now in Second Timothy chapter four, let us read verse nine if you're there. Second Timothy chapter four, verse nine. One to go. Do your best. To come to me quickly. Paul is telling his disciple Timothy. He says, try your best. To come to me. How? Uh -uh. How? It's like, maybe if you're a late comer in church. 
and then I write you a letter and I say, do your best to attend service early. <laughs> but here Paul is saying, because Paul is already becoming an old man, he's about to wrap up his ministry. And then over the years, he has seen a young man from Lois, his grandmother, to Eunice, his mother, and then the faith was handed over to him. And then Paul took up the responsibility to begin to disciple the young Timothy. And now he's saying to Timothy, Try your best, whatever you can do it, so that you can come to me also quickly. Let us find out why. Because on a normal day, since Paul is a veteran in the faith, does he really need anybody? We must be aware of Christianity and leadership. That makes it look as if we don't need anybody. Tell your neighbor, we all need ourselves. All right, so we all need one another. There is a way the man of God can look and, and behave and we feel... This pastor does not need anybody. It's not true. There is a way the member can also be able to say, this member does not need anybody. It is not true. Every healthy Christian needs another Christian. Are we together? And then we all need God. Let's find out. Why did he say Timothy should come quickly? Is it because, let's find out. Verse 10, 1, 2, ready, read. 2 Timothy 4, 10. Let's go. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me. And has gone to Thessalonica. Brother, turn this a little more, a little more. You see why we all need. You see one of the ways we all need one another. Somebody should be able to turn the. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Paul identified. Remember in the in um, chapter one verse fifteen. You know he mentioned two names there. Do you remember? Uh, uh, no, no, no. Go there. You didn't. It. No. Second Timothy chapter one. Look at verse fifteen. He says, you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelos and Hermogenes. He says, Phygelos and Hermogenes, they did what? They left me. Meaning what Paul was expecting was that if nobody leaves me, if everybody leaves me, at least Phygelos and Hermogenes should what? Stay. Hmm. But if you go to chapter 4 and verse 9, he now said, do your best to come to me quickly. Why? Because Demas, Demas, who loved this present world, has deserted me. He doesn't stop there. He now says that he has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. But he noted that Demas left him understand this no matter how effective a leader is a leader can never maximize his leadership potential if he has inconsistent followers a pastor will not fulfill the great commission if he has unserious members a ministry will not reach the nations if they have fluctuating brethren there are Christians, let me talk about this. There are Christians who are more serious about every other ministry than the ministry where they are fed. That is a sign of misplaced priority. There are Christians that do not mind traveling to another state to attend a fire conference by a popular preacher that they like. But their local church pastor and the messages he preaches to them, they do not consider it important. That is misplaced priority. Hear me. Your pastor was called, trained, and raised and sent by God for your spiritual nourishment. Meaning that the first place God expects you to get your spiritual diet after your private work with God is what? The messages and the teachings of your pastor. If you leave the most important diet in your Christian journey and you begin to run around for party food, party food does not raise any child. Are you still following me? Look at verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse 16. 1, 2, read. Still same chapter, all right? 1, 2, read. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. Now, Paul is identifying people and what they have done. If Paul, a human being, can identify people and what they did, how much more God that sees everyone? Go to verse 21 of the same text. 
verse 21. Verse 21. Want to read? Do your best. Notice in verse 9, he says, Do your best to come to me. Right? Now in verse 21, he says again, Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. You have identified something very important here already. That Paul was a people person. For you to be a partner in the gospel, you must imitate Paul in not thinking that you can be an island as a Christian. No man is an island of anything. The Christian was not designed to be independent. The Christian was designed to be interdependent. Meaning that we should steer up one another onto good works. We should challenge one another to be better. If we do not challenge one another to, let me tell you, people will not give their commitment if we do not ask for it. If you are not willing to be committed, it may be a sign that you have not had the message of commitment or you have chosen to be what? Not committed. But I wonder how it will be when we stand before Jesus in heaven and they are sharing crowns and stones and prayers and all the things that revelation says they will share for us and then some of us now get to heaven god forbid i said god forbid some of us now get to heaven and i say ah hey, you, are, you spent 86 years on earth when they added all the time you ever went to church and took it serious it was only 16 hours old. so so you you can't get crowned just just give get, get, let that just let that just do it <laughs> No. I want to get to heaven. Like Jesus said, that we should invest our treasures in the place where moth and rust do not devour. I want to get to heaven and the things I receive from the Lord with the well done, thou good and faithful servant, it should be enough to make me joyful for all of eternity. Why should you get to heaven and then you are regretting that you should have done more for Jesus? There are those that will get to heaven truly and they will say, ah, I wish I listened to those sermons. I wish I took my pastor seriously. I wish I attended church. I wish I did not look down. Imagine, imagine, the way that Utos have said that actually, that some people will get to heaven and they will find out that they were giants, but they never discovered who they really were. Some of you, I don't want you to get to heaven and then you discover that you had giftings of God, but you will never tap into it. Why? Because we did not demand stewardship from you and you two were not willing to be committed. Tell your neighbor, God forbid. Uh -huh. In Exodus chapter 4, let's turn there. Exodus chapter 4. And what I want to do tonight is to show you what I call examples of partners in the ministry. Examples of partners in the ministry. I'm going to show you some of them tonight and we're going to pick lessons from their lives. Go to Exodus chapter 4 and look at verse 13. If you're learning God's word, say amen. amen. Alright. Exodus chapter 4. Look at verse 13 now. Let's read it. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 13. See what he says. But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord, Please send someone else. Another person will say, by whose hand, all right, are you going to get this done? Look at the next verse. The next verse is something interesting. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, what did he say? What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. And then God told Moses, Tell him the things that I've told you, and then he will be your, you know, your spokesman. Moses was ordained by God in Exodus chapter 3. You know, he had the encounter with the burning bush. And Moses saw the bush that was burning, but was not being burned. And God commissioned Moses as the deliverer of Israel. But hear me, the deliverer of Israel could not fulfill his assignment to deliver until he had, number one, an assistant, an interpreter. I hope you know that Moses was a stutterer. Moses had speech impediment. Remember, in our studies of the book of Revelation, we read and studied the songs of who? 
the songs of Moses and the songs of the Lamb. If you look at how long the song of Moses was, even while we were reading it, we knew that this one is long. If a stammerer was to be singing that, service would have ended, we would still be there. Now I'm saying that there are people that God places, I'm going to apply it to you individually and then corporately as a church. There are people that God places in your lives to be your helpers. And there are people that God places you in their lives to be their helpers. Meaning that it is both ways. You are sent to help some people and then some people are sent to help you. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Say that again. You are sent to help some people and then some people are sent to help you. I'm praying that out of the two of them, may you not miss anyone. Because if you miss your assignment to help people, meaning what God has given them for a generation, if it is not accomplished, you are one of those that God will hold responsible. Or God in his mercies can replace you while you are alive and send another person. You know that if men do not praise him, he will raise stones. And they will lift up their voice and even do a better job. Are we together? Man can go off key. Stones will not go off key. That is why anytime we think that we are the center of what God is doing and that God can do without us, we are already entering into pride. There is nobody, including you and me, that is indispensable in the agenda of God. And that's why it's a privilege. And so I'm saying that if you do not see yourself as somebody sent to help others and do not fulfill your own as a helper of others, imagine if you were the one sent to Paul to support his ministry. And you failed in your responsibility. And Paul was not able to write the books he wrote. What do you think will happen to Christianity today? I hope you know that a large portion of the New Testament was written by Paul. After the Gospels, what you have is the Epistles, And then you have Revelation. Are you, are you following me at all? I'm saying that only God knows where you are defaulting. In your own assignment to partner that is affecting the ministry and affecting the output and affecting the effectiveness of those you are sent to and of the local church that you are part of. Do you know that somebody has rightly said that a pack of sheep led by a lion will do better than a pack of lions led by a sheep? What does that mean? The attitude of the leader and your willingness to take responsibility is going to affect the overall output of your corporate gathering. And so it is possible for a ministry to not be up to 50, but they are shaking things and they are moving things. Are you here? And they are changing things. Are you here? And they are affecting lives. And they are, you are wondering, how many are you saying? Well, you say, no, no, you guys are like 1,000. No. Why? Commitment. And then the people that God sends to help you, if they fail in their responsibility, do you know it will affect you? You don't think so? It will affect you. That's why you must understand that aspect of partnership. Once you get it right, every day of your life, you will be conscious, I am a partner. Holy Spirit, how can I partner with you today? Let us continue. Now here, in Exodus chapter 4, you see how that Aaron was sent to help Moses fulfill his ministry. But notice, the assignment was bigger than the both of them. It was not just about Moses. You know, sometimes, when a pastor calls you and asks you, Amen? Are we together, please? Now, when a pastor calls you, or when I call you, let me say, let me say, hey, pastor, let me pray to you. I'm preaching to you. When I call you and I ask you, okay, these are the things we want to achieve. This is what we will need. Now, the average person or the average canal brethren or the young Christian that does not really have understanding is not going to see it as we are doing it unto the Lord. Is that true? Firstly, we say, ah, oh, let me support pastor. And that's nice, but the day you move from pastor to seeing it as this is an opportunity to serve the Lord in this assignment, that day, the way your blessings will come will change. Because now, God has seen you as a partner, not as a business. What do we call it now? Uh, a business. Uh, it, you are not seeing the work as a business transaction. 
you are seeing it as we are partners in this. So you are not a hireling. You are a son in the kingdom. Go to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. Look at verse 9 to 13. Exodus 17. Look at verse 9 to 13. Here, the children of Israel were like waging a war against the Amalekites. And it got to a time, God gave a prophetic instruction. And you need to see what exactly the Bible is saying here. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I will stand on top of the hill with the staff right, of God on my hands. Listen. The call of God is like the staff of God on the hands of a man of God. When the call of God is to be actualized and is to be effective in a generation, God will necessarily need to send people that will support the one with that staff, that will support the man with the calling. Now hear this. There is what we call a heavenly calling. Somebody say heavenly calling. A heavenly calling is that personal one-on-one -on -one encounter that a man truly has with God and God gives specific instruction for his ministry assignment. Moses had it. All right? And many other patriarchs in the Old Testament and even in their time, you know. However, apart from heavenly ordination, there is also what we call earthly confirmation. Earthly confirmation is that God can call a man and God's servant can also call other men. God allows men to call men. Are you here? Don't say this is sounding like a pastor's conference. Yes, our son is reaching the Lord, equipping the same. If we don't teach you ministry, listen, all this, let's do minister's conference. You too, you are what, sir? A minute. Are you here? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you. So, you need to understand that here, the Amalekites, God has already called Moses. And it was a divine call in Exodus 3. But now, Moses is saying, ah, we will meet certain people. Let us call them. Now, hear this. The way to be an effective partner is that any time you are called upon to do the will of God, huh, it is a calling. We think that a calling must be spectacular. And I say, I, sir, pastor, I just want an angel. The angel says, I should give my time. Uh, now, I'll start giving my time. If you need an angel to convince you, that means that in your Christian journey, you are far behind schedule. You don't need a dramatic encounter to be committed. You need to decide to be committed. Are you here? Let me give an example. Brother Emmanuel, please come. Now, hear the voice of God. Brother Emmanuel. Okay, we'll go call you Brother Emmanuel. Emmanuel, my son. Now, you didn't run. If God is calling, is this how you will respond to God? Come go and come back. And run like, but make sure that I was amen. Now, amen. <laughs> All right. Emmanuel, my son. Now, hear me. The average Christian wants to respond like this if he can never hear the audible voice of God. Is that true? How many of you, you desire God should just say, Oh, take me to a say, Ha. Oh, no, let me. Ha. Ha. Let hear me. And then you say, God, call me again. Let me record it and show my friends that you call me. <laughs> now, this is God calling a man. See the way he responds. Is that correct? Now, man, I'm saying that a man under God can also call men. And guess what? The weight, the import, the end product can be as, as, as the same level as the major voice of God. Are you ready now? Now, my sister, what's your name? Eh? Elin. Now, I've called him like God. It's God that called him. Now, a man of God wants to call him for God's purpose. Eli. Eli. Don't wait for sister. It's God is God. Eli. Okay, a man of God for respect. Sister Eli. Now clap for her. She ran. Clap for her. Now, the children of or she did it. Now, notice where I'm going. I'm saying that you hear me. Your response to the call of God on your life is going to determine the effectiveness and the fulfillment you experience on the face of the earth before you die. And the amount and the weight and the quality of reward that you receive in eternity. 
Now, your the quality, please come, of your response to the call of man on behalf of God is of the same implication as the main voice of God calling a man. So whether a pastor tells you an angel came and mentioned your name to do something in fact, eh, it is better to not lie against God or angels and just say, we need to buy a speaker and we need 300, no, no, speaker is 500,000 minimum. 500,000 to buy a speaker. How many of you think that we need better sound as God increases us and this and that? And then you come willingly, why? Right? Because you understand that, okay, God is making a demand through our pastor. And since what our pastor is saying does not contradict the word of God. Our pastor is not saying, brethren, because we need to get a speaker, um, we shall need AK-47 rifles, at least three pieces, and then our FT brothers hear the voice of God, we shall go and storm a bank. No, you already know that is in contradiction to what the Bible says. So I'm saying God can call you personally by a witness in your spirit, by a revelation and an encounter, and if none of those things happen at all, at least God can call you through those you trust to be having a work with God. And as long as you test what they are saying, and it is in line with the word of God, then you can take it also as seriously as you would have taken the voice of God that called Samuel before the ark. Are we together? Please clap for them, let them go back. God may call you again, but are we together now? So you must see it that way. That every assignment every opportunity to serve see it as God, God is calling someone, whom shall we send who will go for us I hope you know, they did not ask Isaiah that question in Isaiah chapter 6, did God say hey, Isaiah, who will go for us is that what God said huh? imagine God not saying hey, Emmanuel, who will go for us no, that's not, that's not my question you're already telling Emmanuel, Emmanuel, go for us no, that's not what God did, God just asked who will go for us Meaning there are certain assignments, opportunities, privileges to serve and to make impact that are open to everybody. But it is only those that hear and see that this is God working through this that will respond well. So if you do not respond to the call of God, you are shortchanging yourself from experiencing the glory of God. Moses was one of those few men that you will see the glory of God in the Old Testament. If you will not respond to God, the call of God, you are shortchanging yourself from experiencing the glory of God. So we are saying that Moses had help us. Moses had help us. Let's go to Exodus chapter 18. Now from verse 19 to 23, Exodus chapter 18, verse 19 to 23. Exodus 18, verse 19 to 23. See what the Bible says. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way. Now, now, now look at this. What is happening here is that Moses had been trying to do everything. And Jethro, his father-in-law, looked at him and felt, ah, if you continue like this, you are going to die. And so what Jethro advised him was, listen, you don't need to try to do everything. I know that the call of God and the body is very strong on your heart. But there are people on ground. If you trivialize them and think they don't have anything to offer, you will die before your time and they will succeed you and still do what you think they cannot do. So God, so God through Jethro now told Moses let me ask you a question who called Moses oh yeah who called Moses was it Jethro that called Moses but who collected the called man meaning God can call a man and God can still use a man to help a man that he called to do what he sends him that a man has been called by God does not mean he can now do everything and anything. He needs people to help him or else even he himself may not know what he's doing at times. Because no man of God knows everything. Are you here? Uh, are you here? Now here, 
Jethro advised him, okay, choose elders. And then he chose 70 men. And guess what? He said, I'm going to. He says, teach them what to do and delegate them. Do you know that what God now did to step in was that God said he should gather them. And he should minister to them. And guess what? The spirit of God that was resident in Moses, manifesting powerfully through the calling of God upon his life, rested upon 70 elders in a very mighty way. And they were able to replicate what Moses was doing at the level of the capacity that God had given them. What does that mean? That means that, listen, when God calls a man, he calls many others with him. But it's only those that hear that calling that can respond and follow him. Are you here? Ah, are you here? Yes. Take another point. We're making progress. So we have said that Moses had helpers. Let's take, take another one. David had Jonathan. David had Jonathan for Samuel chapter 18. I'm not wasting time calling upon the Lord. Are you wasting time? Oh, calling upon, calling upon the Lord. First Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. Look at what it says. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David and he loved him as himself. When the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1, that Jonathan became one in spirit with David, what is he saying actually? He's saying that they, 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 there was resonance. He's saying that the union that they had was very deep level of intimacy. It was what we would call koinonia. And that's why when you look at verse 3, he says, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Let me tell you, any leader you do not like may not likely get your full support. Is that true? Some of you, the reason why you did not like your class captain when you were in secondary school and to today you still hate him if you remember it, is because he used to write your own name for a noisemaker. And then as they are beating you, are looking at him. You are cursing him in your mind, but and that's looking at him. And in the future, what you see me saying in this man, he was very wicked. If you do not love a leader, you may not give him your full support. Now I'm going somewhere. There is a tendency to over exalt a spiritual leader and mistake him for God. So you forget that the man of God is a human being like you. And so you can make excuses for your own shortcomings, but you don't think a man of God should have any shortcomings. Why? He must be an angel. That was what Miriam did. And they, she and Aaron spoke against Moses. Do you remember? And God now came to judge them. What am I saying? Am I saying we should condone wickedness and evil? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you must understand the concept of partnership. That the man that God calls is a human being. You that God called to support, you are a human being. But if you do not play your role well, there will be challenge. Now, you must now look beyond the man of God to God himself who called the man. How do I mean? You know, a sister came here one time and I told her that I was not going to forget her illustration. She thought I was joking. And now, that illustration has come to me now and I'm going to use it. Shall I use it? Okay, so shall I use it? Oh, yes. The sister came here for the first time and I was asking the question while I was ministering. And I said, she should describe the pastor. She should describe, how many of you remember? Ah, you will remember. <laughs> Any back to the city, you will remember now. What was the title of last week's album? <laughs> I know you remember. Now, and she said, oh, this, this pastor is a word man. The next thing now say, eh, he's, he's short. He's short. <laughs> then I said, oh, eh. Then I said, okay, I'm short, Ali. Okay. <laughs> now, 
Let's say that shortness, for example, was a is not a deficiency, but let's say it was a deficiency, and that lady could pinpoint it. It can affect a commitment to the call of God for the corporate house if she does not look away from that to focus on the God whom we all gathered to save. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Because Jonathan here made a covenant with David knowing that David too is a human being. But Jonathan said, no, I love David. And I'm going to help him. I will say, do you know Jonathan lost his life? And he was, he, because he was in love with David, he died. And David felt so pain because there was no kind of relationship like that that David ever had again. In fact, if it's not for the sincerity of the Bible, if Jonathan was a woman, David would marry him. You don't think so? So I started saying, no, I'm only asking, will David marry him? I know you want to marry David, but David has already married and has gone and has died. <laughs> First Samuel chapter 23. Look at this. Verse 15 to 17. First Samuel 23, 15 to 17. While David was at Oresh in the desert of Ziv, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Oresh and helped him find strength in God. What does this tell you? A partner is an encourager. I have never ever seen a pastor that is continually discouraged by his members that fulfills his ministry. I've never also seen a member that is continually talked down on by their pastor that fulfills their ministry. We must mutually edify one another. Meaning, I'm bringing out the best in you, and you are what? Bring, uh -huh, I'm bringing out the best in you. Do you see, do you see already? Everybody's already choosing their own. Way. <laughs> Saul was, was David's enemy. David was not Saul's enemy. But Saul was his enemy. Saul hated him, and Saul wanted to kill him. Saul was insecure. And Jonathan was the son of Saul. And Jonathan was willing that even if my father kills me, so that David can be alive, it's okay. How many of you, because of your love for God, leave your pastor, your love for God, can say, you know what? My one month salary. Once I remove something to sustain, let me give everything to the house of God. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. I was following a meeting by Pastor Dela Shumakinde, the pastor of uh, the Envoy Nation, the baptizing church in Leicester, I think in the UK. And he shared a story, he had a story of how that a, a guru, you know guru, okay, you know guru Maharaji. Some of you think guru is his name, no. Guru, a guru is like all these wise spiritual men. All right, now this man brought a guru to his house to come and guide him on what to do and to help him. This man was a very wealthy man. The guru entered his house and he was taking care of the guru, giving him everything that he would need. And the guru looked at him one day and said, You know what? Sell this house relocate back to india take the all the money you get from this house that you sell sell it to your tenant sell this house that you are the landlord to your i'm talking of the spirit that was moving the guru told the guru to tell the landlord to sell the house to his tenant at whatever amount the tenant pays and guess what to take that money and go back to India to use it to sponsor the organization that sponsored him to come here to become a medical doctor. Do you know what it means to be a medical doctor abroad and have spent many years there? Do you, know, do you, do you think you have $1,000 in your account? Do you think that's all you have? To build a house as a medical, do you think it will be a two-bedroom flat you build? 
Guess what? So when this man wanted to sell the house, he put high price. He looked for nobody but. Then the tenants now said, "This is how, how much I have." To show you in submission to a spirit that is not the spirit of God, the man listened to what his guru said and sold it at the price the tenant wanted to buy it. And because there was delay, you know, in some transactions, he needed to now rent a room in the house and become a tenant in the house where he was once a landlord. Because he was obeying the instruction of a spirit by a guru. Eventually, he went back to India, got that money, gave to the organization, and went back to India. Now, I want to ask you a question. If I, as your pastor, as someone already said, pastor, uh, continue your sermon, leave that story. <laughs> if I, and those of you online, if I, as your pastor, say, uh, brethren, the Lord led me to tell you um, any money you make this month, all of it together, don't even pay any time, don't pay any offering, all of it together that you make this month. Remove only 10% out of the entire money and then you take the tithe, bring the 90% to the house of God. Since you have been giving God 10% all the while and your 10% has been fluctuating, maybe once in nine months, God now say, you now you will take the 10%. Give me the 90%. How many of you will say, Pastor, thank you? Ah, the voice of the man of God is also like the voice of God. I believe, glory to God. I made it for my advancement. <laughs> if it was you that built house like that medical doctor, your pastor now came to do a video and say, Ah, the Lord said you should sell this house and give the money to the house of God and then go back to your village. Will you do it? The reason why some of us cannot be effective partners in the work of God and the reason why some of us are not having our needs met is because we are not really seeking first the kingdom of God we are seeking first our own things say amen it is true first John 2 15 love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man loves the world the love of the father is not in him and these are the things that are in the world the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh and the pride of life they are not of the father but they are of the world and in Matthew 6 33, what did Jesus say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be what are added. Added. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have misplaced a phone before? A phone. I know I think phone is one of the guys. If I say laptop, not all of us have laptops. Phone, raise up your hand. Let me see. You've misplaced a phone before. How do you feel when you misplaced the phone? You felt, oh, glory to God. Wow, another, you know, just life. How did you feel? Did you feel bad? Answer, did you feel bad? No, I'm not putting words in your mouth. You felt good, no, Allah. If you felt bad, say, I felt bad. Now, let me ask you. If you are, if you are the one that has misplaced phone, raise up your hand. Let me see you. How long did it take you, take you to get another phone? A month, that's four weeks. How long did it take you to get another phone? Two days. Hmm. How long did it take you to get another phone? A year. Okay, but you got another phone now. Yeah. Two years. No, don't lie in the house of God. Though. What about you? Instantly. Uh -huh. A sister said, now, hear me now. A sister said, instantly. Another one said, two days. One said, two years. Those ones are first time. So, anything they say, let's. Now, hear me. If you can need to get another phone right away, sometimes because of your social status, your financial capacity, the type of phone. Like the phone we used to do our video, if, if you lost now, you may not get it immediately. Because there's no easy buy for it. I hear. Some phones can do easy buy, some cannot. Easy buy does not do them. Now I'm trying to let you understand that if you could take a phone so seriously, but you will need to get it because of the contact and the relationships you have there. How about heaven where you have treasure? If you took Christianity and the kingdom that seriously, don't you think something would have shifted in your life? I want you to experience a mind shift tonight. That listen, the Holy Ghost is the greatest helper, but you two are a privileged supporter in what he's doing. Can we continue, please? That's why 
You also must understand that David did not only have Jonathan. David had warriors. First Chronicles chapter 12. First Chronicles chapter 12, quickly. First Chronicles chapter 12. He had warriors. Because if it was only Jonathan and Jonathan had died. But look at First Chronicles chapter 12. Can we read verse 16 to 18? First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 16 to 18. See what he says. Let's read together. One to go. All the Benjamites and some men from Judah also came to David in his stronghold. David went out to meet them and said to them, If you have come in peace to help me, I am ready for you to join me. But if you have come to betray me to my enemies, when my hands are free from violence, may the God of our ancestors see it and judge you. Then the spirit came upon Amasai, chief of the thirty, and he said, We are yours, David. We are with you, son of Jesse. Success, success to you, and success to those who help you, for your God will help you. And then what did David do? He received them and made them leaders. You know why some people will never become leaders in the house of God? Their attitude towards leadership does not, okay, their attitude towards leadership disqualifies them from the privilege to ever be a leader. There is what is called empathy. There is a way you can sit down and think about what your leaders must be going through and just thinking about it and say, oh God, help them. It's not easy. I can feel for them. You may think you are just being nice. God is noting all those things. Every time you make yourself available to make things easier, to contribute to your role, you are heaping up blessings for yourself. Yes, it's true. God does not forget our labors of love. It's not unrighteous to forget our works and labor of love. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. But David had warriors. And that's why I asked them, do you come in peace? Because attitude matters. You must have the attitude of a helper. You must have a heart to help. Because sometimes it may not be in the job that you'll be needed. It may be one day you'll be going somewhere and somebody will need your help. It may not even be money. It may be something that looks inconsequential. Well, that's, that's your destiny helper. And some people, because of the wrong attitude, have lost a chance of a lifetime. I've met people in my life, let me tell you one. Many years ago, and this is an awesome testimony, but I'm not going to say everything. Many years ago, not many years ago, maybe four years ago, I was to attend the Christ Embassy, Christ Embassy, Pastor Chris Oyakilume, and their IPPC, their pastors and you know leaders conference at um, their camp, you know, close to that Ibadan way. And I put it online because I, I didn't know how to obtain the form or all that. So I put it on Facebook. I commented that, please, I'm, I want, I really wish to go. Who will help me? I don't know what it would take, but I really wish to go. Somebody said, go to the branch and I pray. I went and they said, oh, sorry, there's no more chance and all that. And somebody from the comment section private chatted me and said, you need an opportunity. I, how serious are you? I said, I'm so serious. I want to go. It's all right. If you can try to make it to the camp at the entrance. Don't worry, I'll pick you up. Lo and behold, that relationship, that one relationship, must have brought to me at least, at least, more than one million naira in my life time, in four years. And I'm not saying uh, 13,000 per week, uh -uh, like 200,000, 300,000, 400,000, 500,000. Why? Because I commented on a post on Facebook that I desire to attend the program. They fed me in the program, gave me money, carried me to, paid my transfer fare back. It was good measure, pressed down, shaking together. And I'm telling you that your attitude can open doors for you and it can show doors against you. And because charity begins at home, it is better we learn it in church than we go and learn it outside. Are we together tonight? Yesterday morning, I woke up. I just woke up. And as I took my phone to just, you know, I just bless God. And let me just check my phone. I don't know you. You know, sometimes MTN has a way of leaving message for you. So that when you wake up, you see MTN. Or Glow. That's why I don't use them again. Really. You know Glow does that, I mean. You just wake up and I, I looked at this name. Man, this name. This name is familiar, but I don't know. Then the person just started me on Facebook. Please just manage it. Manage it. 
I'm praying for you. May, may somebody reach out and say, my lady. Yeah. Uh, I know. Once I preach money, you, you, are, you are alive. My people are alive. I think I just look at you. I think I just look at you. Maybe I should use it to encourage you. All right? Maybe to encourage you. This man I'm talking about sent me 350k. 350k. Just like that. I did not say give me money. I know you support me. He just said, you, I, I feel, I just, if you have somebody like that in your life, that is supplying like that. Amen? Amen. But it is attitude first. God must have seen me do other things too. Not going on Facebook and say, ah, my pastor said we should become a TIA. Ah, he's a only chat. <laughs> and, and this brings me to something. Do you know on our ministry page on WhatsApp, and let me say this, there are people that I do not know here, but they follow the ministry. And there are people there that I know here, and they follow the ministry. And there are people that follow the ministry and comment and respond as if I'm their father. Do you understand? Know like when I say something, they respond. Do you know that as a leader, such people hold a place in my heart that people that are not that are not showing that they are following, but they say they are following in their heart. We don't need ghost disciples. We need real disciples. Are you here? The disciples of Jesus were not. Are you here? Oh? Mm. Because when Jesus needed a point, he did not say. Mm -mm. He called his own to say and sent them errands. Are you following here? The disciples were not only receiving teaching; they were running errands. It was part of Jesus's discipleship water model. Today, as we enter there, everybody were are I say, "Hey, we are catching it." You will not know where you will get to, and that attitude, attitude, your will say a fee, eh, that your attitude is like smoke. You cannot hide it for long. It will show. One time, I was in a Korea airport about two years or three years ago to do some work, this FAA thing, and then I went to do one job for a, a man at Remita there, and I was there, and immediately the Elijah saw me. The Elijah said, "You are a pastor." I said, I don't have it. He said, you're a pastor. Just tell me you're a pastor. I said, uh -uh. Ma, and I did not wrestle with that. He said, you're a pastor. I said, okay. He said, hey. She said, there's a way you people used to. I said, I said, hey, yeah, that's it. It's better because on the day, when something bigger will come, they say, look at, look at, this one. This one looks. I'm praying for you that may the right attitude distinguish you for favor. Yeah. In the name of Jesus Christ. In 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 15 to 19, you see that David had a mighty man. But I want us to enter the New Testament so that we can pray. The New Testament, Jesus had disciples. From the start of the ministry of Jesus, you would think Jesus would just be praying and fasting. After praying, he went and began to choose disciples. Why? Even Jesus knew that the Great Commission, his assignment on earth, although it's salvific work, the death must be alone. But he knows that before that one, there must be supporting strikers to make sure that he gets there and what needs to be done is done. Look at Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. I'll just give you four more points and then we'll pray. Mark 3, 13 to 15. If you're there, we can read it together. Mark 3, 13 to 15. All right, let's go. One, two, three. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. Verse 14, he appointed 12, that they might be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. Now, Jesus went to pray, to seek the face of God, is that true? But did Jesus call them as God, or as a man? Children of God. Did Jesus call them as God, or as a man? It's like saying, oh, bro, Jesus. And then he said, Peter, are you come, follow me. That's what happened. So it was man calling them, all right? But we know that Jesus is God in the flesh. Do you understand that now? So when we say workforce, when we say volunteer, when we say there's something we want to do, hiding yourself is only shortchanging yourself from God's blessing. Because whether you like it or not, the job will still be done. Amen. It will be done. Jesus had disciples. And what were they doing? They were learning from him. They were becoming stronger in the faith. They were learning to do the, the work of the ministry. They had authority over demons. And they were fulfilling their calling. And what was their service? They did various things. Some of them, you know, went to rent hotel for the 
space for the last supper. One went to get cold, you know, to hire boat. Are you here? Are you for if it's our That's what will happen. They will get bold. And then for the uh, for the last last supper, they will get one banquet hall. Are you here? Uh -huh. Or a resort center. Is that correct? One went to fetch water. One went to get yes. That's how it is. One did transportation and logistics, accommodation, every hospitality, taxes, payment and funds. One was treasurer. Yes, everything was there. Number two, Jesus had disciples. Number two, Jesus had women partners in his ministry. Because his sisters may say, sir, eh, we don't know. It's like, eh, it's like it's only men. No, no, no. Ministry is not for only men. Ministry is for men and women. But roles may differ. Are we understanding it? Yes, sir. Turn to Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. I want you to leave here with the consciousness that you are a partner in this work. Now, listen, that every day you miss church, you should, you, should feel, you should feel bad about it. You should feel bad. Ah, eh, no, eh, I must be there. Yes, not showmanship, not eye service. It's, it's, it's your father's house. Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. Now, notice something. Because for those who say, oh, uh, Christianity, uh, there's gender, but no, no, no gender bias, it's just a real difference. I hope you know that among the 12 disciples, there were no women there. Were there women there? Were there women there among the 12? No. But were women instrumental in the ministry of Jesus? I bet you, yes. Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. Let's read it together. One to go. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to one. Do you see why I used to travel often? I want to be like Jesus. So I travel about from one village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. One, Mary called Magdalene, from whom are many demons? Seven demons have come. It, listen, child of God, your past experience does not invalidate what God can do with you in the present. That a demon left you, that you are aborted, that you lost a baby, that you lost an opportunity, uh, that you did not have a nice marriage, uh, that somebody cheated you, lied to you, scammed you, all those things. Let the past be past. Because God gives beauty for ashes. Did I hear an amen now? Yes. Forget about the past. Paul said, forgetting the past, pressing forward to that which is before me. That's what we should do. Here, yeah, Jesus, the Bible says, there were women that had evil spirit. I like the fact that the Bible did not hide that they had, it didn't say women from the sand. He said, no, evil spirit. Meaning that the ministry of Jesus has impacted them in a way. His teachings had helped them. The power of God through his life and his ministry has done something in their lives. And they said, no, we will partner with him. And then that leads us to the next verse. See what they did. The Bible says, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. Somebody say many others. Can I pray for you as I pray for myself in this season? May we receive the ministry of many other partners. Yeah. Look at that precious man of God that I mentioned now. He's not a member of our church. I don't even know if he has even listened to my sermon before. He's an engineer. He came to Akure once. When he came to Akure to do a job, I went to preach in a church. He came to that church, sit, sat down quietly in the congregation. I pre I didn't even know that it was one. I was just that. I've seen this person before. He came for the meeting. After that, he left for Lagos. He didn't even come to our house. He didn't even attend our service. See, when God sends men to you, may God send men to you. No one listen. See, Jesus and his disciples did not beg. When women of that caliber and many others, you know what that means? There were multiple streams of support coming for Jesus to take care of himself, to take care of his disciples, and to get the job done. Is he listen? A hungry pastor will soon be an angry pastor. Let me ask you: if the, your, the responsibility of the church members is to provide for the welfare of their pastor, let me ask you. If that was true, and it is in the Bible, 
Do you know that it is possible that 95 percent of us do not even know anything about the love of our pastor? Now, I know you want to look at this now. The message is strong, but you, you prefer that distraction. Look here. <laughs> Let me say that again. I'm saying that if the welfare of your pastor was dependent on you, for example, do you know your pastor would have died? Uh, would have died. Ah. That's why God needed to look for many others. You see that? Some of them are part of you. God will to them and say, take care of that one. I remember, uh, uh, take care of that pastor. That's what I'm telling you. But when God put it in your heart and says, you know what? Support your pastor. A portion to your pastor every month. Okay? A portion to the church every month. Hey, be faithful in your tithes and offerings. I do not receive any, any salary from this ministry. And I'm doing my best as God has given me grace. But a wise member does not hear that and say, hey, that's a good pastor. <laughs> a good pastor will not become a bad pastor in Jesus' name. And what did they do? What did they do? Somebody just made me laugh now. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, right? Susanna, many others. See what they did now. Read it. These women were helping to support them out of their... Okay, okay, okay. It's not your own Bible. Read your own version. Let me hear. Read it loud. Uh -huh. Joanna, from Joanna. From Joanna, read Louder. Which did what, sir? Ministered unto him of their substance. Meaning that it was a steady thing. He didn't say minister one day and then they said, bro, oh, this is what God has helped me with his mind. We just might. No. Here, my version says, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. So, Jesus had disciples. Jesus had women. This is Jesus. So the word that was made flesh. Supporting the word. Take the third one. Paul had Timothy. We have said that. Paul had Timothy. Timothy was available. Timothy was willing to serve. Timothy was not self-willed. He was not stubborn. He was willing to participate. He did not have a personal agenda. He just wanted Paul to fulfill the ministry. Knowing that in Paul's fulfillment of ministry, he too is fulfilling his own assignment. Also, we see there was Barnabas. Paul had Mark. Paul had Silas. Paul had Barnabas. Barnabas was called the son of encouragement. Paul acknowledged many supporters in his work. And I showed you that last week, Romans 16. Many names of people that has helped him in the work and in the ministry. You see men like, like, like Stephanos, Fortunatus. Women like Aquila, all right? You see, sorry, Priscilla. You see women like Phoebe. You see men like Epaphroditus, a fellow worker, a co-laborer, who labored for you traveling in prayer on your behalf day and night Paul called him a fellow laborer and there are many other unnamed believers that also labored and made sure that the work was done it's called synergy it's called synergy now I'll wrap up with this for tonight and next week I'm going to touch on the portrait of a devoted partner but let me wrap up with this do you notice that there was a man that preceded the ministry of Jesus that allowed for the fulfillment of the ministry of Jesus to happen? His name was John the Baptist. Do you know that here? Hmm. John the Baptist's ministry must come before the ministry of Jesus. Do you know? The Bible says he must go in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. Meaning that John will have the spirit of Elijah. It does not mean John will be Elijah. But he's going to function in the dimension of Elijah. Turning the hearts of the fathers back to the hearts of the children. Do you understand what I'm saying now? Now when John came, John did not look like Elijah in visage. But the authority of his ministry showed that there was a prophetic dimension to it. And when Jesus came to the scene, Jesus said, of all that is born of a woman, there is none that is greater than John. Of all prophets, 
He said John was the greatest prophet. Now, John's assignment was to prepare the way for the Messiah that was to come. Now, John was a cousin to Jesus. If John here me, did not discover his ministry, partner with the Holy Spirit to fulfill his ministry, and prepare the way for the Messiah that was to come, there will be problems. Because John must come before Jesus, not after. I'm telling you that your hesitation in obeying, your hesitation in staying planted, your hesitation in being committed, your hesitation in giving, your hesitation in praying, your hesitation in serving, is actually affecting the kingdom in a way. And God is considering whether to bring the word to you like he has done now so that you can repent. Because if there is no repentance, what follows is replacement. If there is no repentance, what follows is replacement. And that's why I want us to pray tonight. And the prayer is very simple. You're going to rise to your feet. We're praying tonight. And we're going to pray like this. We're going to say, Lord. You're going to rise to your feet. Oh, yes. We're praying now. Say, Lord. You know, I just thought you on partnership. Huh? Say, Lord. Lord. May my faithfulness. And the way I conduct myself be a source of joy. Louder. A source of joy. Uh -uh. Louder. A source of joy. A source of refreshing. A source of strength. To those for whom and with whom I walk. Let's say that again. Say, Lord. May my faithfulness, my stewardship, and my service be a source of blessing, be a source of joy, be a source of encouragement, be a source of strength to those I work with in the name of Jesus. Can you go ahead and talk to the Lord tonight and say, Father, my availability, my service, my attitude, my stewardship, my faithfulness, let it be a source of encouragement, a source of lifting, a source of joy, a source of strengthening for my pastor and those that I work with and those that I serve with. That in the name of Jesus, I decide and I receive grace to be a faithful steward, to be a faithful partner, for it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. I receive grace to be a faithful partner. I will give my best. I will play my part. I will fulfill my role in the name of Jesus, that my life will be an expression of the fulfillment of prophecy. ECC, let's lift our voice tonight. I want us to pray from the depth of our heart, like people who have understanding that in the name of Jesus, my life is an expression of the fulfillment of prophecy. I obey the gospel. I do the work of the ministry. I partner with my time. I partner with my energy. I partner with creativity. I partner with resources. I partner with relationships. I partner with platforms. I partner with all that the Lord has given unto me. In the name of Jesus. We receive grace tonight. We receive grace tonight to be faithful partners in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. To play our role well. To do all that the Lord has put in our hands. In Jesus' name we are praying. Lift your hands and pray this prayer. Lift your hands and pray this prayer. Paul was praying for the brethren at Ephesus. And then he says that I've heard great things about you. But I also still pray that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And this is our prayer tonight. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus. Church of God, let's do it better. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus. I receive grace to design what to do part time in order to be an effective partner in the gospel. Go ahead and receive grace. Now, go ahead and receive grace. To know what to do part time. To know what to do part time. In order to be an effective partner in the gospel. What to do part time. The Spirit of God led God and Ananias to go lay hands on so that his eyes would be open and that he might receive the Holy Ghost. And that was how his ministry kick started. Some of you will need to receive promptings by the Holy Spirit to do things, to take actions, to reach out, to pray, to intercede. So everything that the Lord would need us to do will be done. Because in the name of Jesus, we are committed partners. We are faithful partners. We are willing partners. 
We are available partners. We are consistent partners. In the name of Jesus. Children of God, can you rebuke the spirit of lukewarmness and rebuke the spirit of discouragement and rebuke the spirit of offense and rebuke the spirit of distraction in the name of Jesus Christ. We make progress by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are not of them that drop back onto perdition. We press in the will of God. We go from grace to grace and from glory to glory. Our path is as the shining light that shines more and more to the perfect day. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto every good work. We do good works. Our light shines before men. It shines so brightly that they see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. We make progress. We continue contribute our quota, we play our role, we receive grace uh, to live sacrificially, to live obediently in the name of Jesus. We lead obedient lives, we are obedient and we are not rebellious, we are obedient and we are not slothful, we are not slothful in business, we are fervent in spirit and we are serving the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we are praying. Now I declare upon you in the name of Jesus, receive grace to be a discerning partner in the gospel. Receive grace to maximize available resources to partner in the gospel. Receive grace to not see what you have as small, but that what you have can be a stepping stone even for more in the name of Jesus. I pray for you that may the Lord cause your eyes to be open, cause your ears to be open, to discern what the Lord is doing. I declare that you are strategically positioned. You are in the right place at the right time and you fulfill God's purpose for your lives. In the name of Jesus, let the month of May answer to you for signs and wonders. Let the month of May answer to you for signs and wonders. Oh my God. Let the month of May answer to you for signs and wonders. The Bible says, believe the Lord God, so shall he be established. Believe his prophet, so shall he prosper. I say, let the month of May answer to you for signs and wonders. Let the name of the God of Jacob defend you. Let the Lord send you supernatural help. Speedy help. In the name of Jesus Christ. And in the end of our journeys, we will look back and we will be grateful for choosing to be partners in the gospel. As we go this week, we partner with Christ. We partner with leadership. We do the right things. And we experience the right results. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Amen.